Vishaya Namaha Saraswatyai Namaha Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Hiyo Jagra Swapna Sushumti Shushkuda Dara Yasam Vidu Jimbhate Yasam Mahadi Pipi Likanta Tanushu Rota Jagat Sakshini Saivaham Nacha Drisha Vastu Tidrida Pragya Pishya Sandalo was to Satu Dvijos to Guru Ritisha Manisha Mama Brahmheva Hamidam Jagacha Sakalam Sinmatra Vistaritam Saita Dumidya Trigunaya Shammaya Kalpitam Isham Yasya Dhramati Sukhatare Nitye Pare Nirmale Chandalos to Satu Dvijos to Guru Ritye Shammani Shammama Shashvaram Evam Idhishamakinam Nishchitya Vacha Guru Nityam Brahma Nirantaram Vimrishata Nirvyaja Shantatmana Dhutam Bhavicha Dushkritam Pradamatam Samvinmaye Pavake Prabhadhaya Samarpitam Svapuri Ishamani Shamama Yadiryam Naradeva Rabi Rahami Yantas Kuta Kriyate Yadhasa Nudayaksha Deva Vishaya Bhantiswato Chetana So now we will do the second verse. Let's look back what we accomplished in the first verse. Two stages. Advaita Vedanta in this uh, Manisha Panchakam is taught in three stages. Two of them have been accomplished in the first verse. What are the two stages? The first one is that I am the consciousness, the witness of the waking, dreaming and deep sleep. So consciousness apart from waker and the waking world, apart from an illumining, pervading the dreamer and the dream world, apart from an illumining the darkness of deep sleep. That consciousness I am. One. That was stage one. There are these procedures in Advaita Vedanta called Prakriya, procedures. 
This is one of them. One procedure is called the method of the three states. These are methods of investigation. Investigation into what? In investigation into what am I? Into who am I? So one way is to look at our experience waking, dreaming, deep sleep and see that there is one consciousness in which all three come and go. They are playing in that one consciousness and I am that one consciousness. That is stage one. There are, there are other procedures like this. For example, seer and the seen. Drik Drishya. Uh, I am the experiencer, the seer. By seer I mean hear, smell, taste, touch. I am the subject, experiencing subject. And whatever I experience, whatever I can label as, this is an object. And I am separate from the object. I am never the object, ever the subject, never the seen, Drishya. Ever the seer, na drishya vastuiti. We, we saw in the third line of this first verse, I am never an object, never a thing, but I am the experiencer of the thing. And obviously the body is experienced as a thing. And so on. So drik drishya viveka, the, the discernment of the seer and the seen, this is another procedure, prakriya. It comes to the same conclusion that I am the witness consciousness. There's another one which we tried in the morning, the way of the five sheets, Pancha Kosha Viveka. That comes to the same conclusion, that I am the witness consciousness apart from the five sheets, which can constitute the human personality, the body-mind complex. Whether Drigdrishya Viveka, whether Pancha Kosha Viveka or Avasthatraya Viveka, I come to know I am the consciousness, unchanging witness consciousness, the experiencer or the subject, pure subject, never an object. By pure, when I say pure subject, pure consciousness, I don't mean in the sense of pure means a good, a nice um, consciousness or a nice subject, you know, free of all bad thoughts. Pure here means the objectless subject. There is no element, a mixture of the object with the subject. It means the seer without any mixture of the seen. Drishya, is not there, it's only the drashta. That's the pure uh, consciousness, what I mean. So this is this was first sentence, the first line of the first verse. Jagrat Swapna Sushupti Shu Sputatara Ya Samvidu Jrimbhate. That one consciousness which is clear in and through waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. That I am. Stage one. Stage two, if you remember. Is it one consciousness only in my waking, dreaming and sleeping and another one there and another one there in each of us separate consciousnesses or one, one consciousness in all separate bodies and minds? And the answer was from the highest gods to the, to the most humble uh, creature crawling on the earth, that awareness inside is one same all throughout. It's one, one consciousness. Bodies are different, nobody doubts it. Minds are different, nobody doubts it. But the witness of the body-mind, that witness consciousness which I find within, is actually everywhere. In all beings. Second stage. Do you see what was achieved in the second stage? It's a unification of consciousness, let us say. One consciousness. So at that level of consciousness, as bodies we are different. As minds we are different. Which means as persons we are different. But beneath it, more fundamental than body and mind. In the background of the body and mind, there is this fundamental oneness, which is this consciousness. Not to be achieved, not that after a lot of Vedanta classes we will be one. No. It's already there. It's an accomplished fact. In Sanskrit, Siddha Vastu. An accomplished fact. It's not something that you have to achieve with a lot of prayers and meditation and studies. We may come to know of it. We may come to be aware of it. But, we means the mind here. The mind may come to recognize it. But we are one at that level. Second stage. But what? it is not Advaita. It is not non-duality yet. Why not? What remains? Now what have we done? At the second stage, the second line of the, of the first verse, we see that we are one consciousness in all bodies and minds. But the moment you say all bodies and minds, the question still remains. What are these bodies and minds? What is this vast world, world universe spread out before consciousness? Maybe I'm one consciousness in all beings, fine. But then that doesn't explain 
the multiplicity, this enormously rich universe spread out and clearly it is different from me. We just did that I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am the witness of the body, I am not the waking world, not the dream world, not the deep sleep darkness, I am the one separate witness of everything. We have done that. So basically we have separated ourselves from the universe. All that, you know, in our state of ignorance we do that. Only the difference, the borderline of separation, the margin of separation is at this body. Up to this body, I am. Beyond this body is the universe, which includes all of you. That's how we think, right? Usually. What has Vedanta done? What it, had do it has done is, it has pushed the body and even the mind out into the universe. I am the witness consciousness. Are you with me? Yeah. I am the witness consciousness and what I earlier thought was I, which I included within the definition of I, has now been pushed out into this. This universe, correct? This body, this mind, this personality, this. So I am the witness. But that still means there is two. Why two? There is plurality. I am the witness and apart from me all of this is here. That is not non-duality. Non-duality would mean one reality apart from which no second exists. Here definitely a second exists. The moment you say I am not the body, not the mind, I am the witness, then the body and mind become a second to you, an other to you. So we have not yet accomplished non-duality. Why did we do this? We will accomplish non-duality now in the third verse, in the second verse. Why did we do this? Because unless we identify, unless we recognize the reality within us, that consciousness, from there we can have non-duality. You cannot have non-duality at the level of the body, because the level of the body there is so much, so much difference. The level of the mind there is so much difference. But when you come to this consciousness, from there now we can, we will proceed to accomplish this non-duality. What does the third, uh, the second verse say at the beginning? It says, Brahmaivahamidam jagatcha sakalam chinmatra vistaritam I am Brahman and this entire universe, jagat, idam jagat cha sakalam, this entire universe, chin matra vistaritam, is an expansion, is a play, is a projection. Vistaritam here in the means the projection of you, Brahman, your consciousness. You, the consciousness, you alone are appearing as the world, as the body, as the mind. See, here is an interesting thing to know about Advaita Vedanta, a key to the secret of Advaita Vedanta. Have you noticed? Advaita Vedanta seems to be saying two contradictory uh, things at the same time. First you say, I am not the body, I am not the mind, uh, I am the witness consciousness, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham, one. And then the, almost in the very breath you seem to say, I am Brahman, everything. How can you say I am not this, not this? The next moment you say I am everything, how is that possible? So always remember, Advaita Vedanta is understood, accomplished, realized in two steps. Last year when I came to Hollywood, I gave a talk. Two steps to the not to. Not to Advaita. Advaita means not to, non-dual. So two steps to the not to. What are the two steps? First, neti neti, not this, not this. By the process of the three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, avastha, trai, viveka, or by the process of Drik Drishya Viveka, or by the process of the five sheets, Pancha Kosha Viveka, by any process, find out that you are this unchanging witness consciousness. Step one. But this is not non-duality. This is what the Sankhya philosophers, the yoga philosophers, they have come to this step already. So this is one step. So next, next step is, whatever you said was not this, not this, now reduce it back into what you found yourself to be. <laughs> You see that I alone am all of this. If you say that you could have said it at the beginning, just say, <laughs> if you're going to say I alone am all of this, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked. If you say I am all of this, but by I, I mean, I have no doubt that I am this body. Now to next say that I am all of this makes no sense. How is the body all of this? Very clearly, just a millimeter away from the body is the clothes, which I am not. So, and rest, forget about rest of the world. So, 
From at the level of the body mind, you cannot say non duality, that I am all of this. It's just ridiculous to say that. To achieve non duality, to realize the non dual truth, first you have to find out that non dual truth within yourself. And then only from that point of view, look back and you see everything. Sri Ramakrishna put it this way When you enter a house and you climb up to the roof, you leave the door behind, the first floor behind, the second floor, and third floor, and finally come to the roof. And then you see, leaving it behind, neti, neti, not this, not this, not this. Then you see what the roof is made of. The same cement and concrete and the um, um, uh, bricks. When you look back, what you left behind, the stairs and the, and the first floor and second floor, and, the, and the up down to the door and the basement, they are all made of the same thing. Then you realize what the roof, that is the absolute, Brahman, pure consciousness. And the rest of it is a projection of that pure consciousness. Then only Advaita is achieved or, or uh, realized. Then only you can say there is one to which there is no second. When Advaita Vedanta is taught as Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Brahman alone is real, the world is false. Why is the world false? What's the point of saying the world is false? When it is false, then it's not a second reality apart from Brahman. If there is the desert and the water, which looks like water in an oasis, you realize it's a mirage. Then are there two things, the desert and the mirage and the, and the water? No, because that's not real water. When you mistake a snake, a rope for a snake, are there two things or one? After the mistake is corrected. There's only one thing, the rope. You don't say there are two things. There's one rope and one real rope and one false snake. You can't count the false with the real. So there is only the real rope. The false snake is nothing other than the real rope mistaken to be separate. Similarly, when we re when we're saying that Brahman is real and the world is false, what it means is Brahman alone is appearing as a separate world. The non-separateness, non-duality of Brahman becomes established. You see, it all boils down to the question of the relationship of consciousness to its objects. There are four possible um, options. What are we talking about? Consciousness and the object. What do you mean by object? What we discussed in the morning today? Whatever, here, whatever you see here in this, uh, this world, whatever you're seeing up to the body and the mind, they're all objects. Objects to what? To you, the consciousness. So now, in the first verse, we established the separation of the two. Now I'm asking a question. There are apparently two things. You consciousness and what you are aware of, what we labeled as this. This world, this person, this body, this mind, this thought, yeah. this Vedanta, this. Now I'm asking what is the relationship between you, the consciousness, and this object, this universe? What's the relationship? Four possible answers. There yeah, may be more, but broadly speaking. One is, one answer is that um, object is fundamental and consciousness emerged from the object. This is one, one possibility. The object, material universe is fundamental and consciousness emerges from the object. Which point of view is this? This is the scientific point of view, the materialist point of view, the reductionist point of view. Um, this is the ancient materialist, Charvaka. And the modern scientist has not gone in principle in principle has not gone one step further than the ancient materialist in detail of course in uh, knowledge and power of course what is the story here the story here goes something like this um, in uh, near the ashram in New York there is the Museum of Natural History so if you go in there there is a big show a 3d show of, about the evolution of the universe and all and Neil deGrasse Tyson, Tyson uh, in his baritone voice, you will hear this story. The story goes like this, that uh, there was this Big Bang billions of years ago. And uh, what we today know as matter and energy and time and space all emerged from there. 
Over billions of years, stars came, uh, were ignited, planets were formed, and on this planet, um, over a process of billions of years, matter became more and more complex. There was organic matter, and that somehow combined to form what we call life forms. And those life forms evolved, and Darwinian evolution kicked in over millions and millions of years small tiny organisms and then more complex and more complex coming out of the oceans into the land they evolved these bodies and Richard Dawkins calls us gene machines fundamental thing is the genes and we are just machines carriers for the genes so everything that we think about ourselves body personality mind consciousness these are all apps used by the genes to propagate themselves um, you are just a machine for the genes so after some time, these bodies became sufficiently complex to evolve, um, uh, evolve nervous systems and brains. And these nervous systems and brains somehow became conscious, consciousness which we feel in ourselves. And now we are asking the question, who are we, where we came from, and science and philosophy and all of that is happening. So consciousness is a very high order evolute. Fundamentally, it is brain which is fundamentally nothing other than a living body, living tissue, which is nothing other than organic matter, which is nothing other than protons and neutrons and electrons, which is nothing other than, if you go further down, quarks and maybe super strings, who knows? And that is the story. So what is fundamental? Object. Matter. Matter, space, time, energy, that is fundamental. Consciousness is a very late development. It has come, that's the story. It has come with the development of very complex living organisms. And so what's the problem? The problem is huge. Because you don't really think of yourself as matter. We ourselves, we think of ourselves as sentient beings, as conscious beings. Right? Um, a scientist says, we, yesterday we were discussing, you are the universe. It sounds very Advaitic. They're not at all. They don't mean it that way. You are, we are the universe means the universe is made of um, free-floating uh, atoms, with, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons and quarks and so on. And we are also made of that. So one day this body will fall apart, we will die, but we'll, those atoms and quarks and neutrons will still be floating around. Uh, so you are in that way, you are there? No, no, no. This doesn't uh, convince us. I am not happy with that. Uh, I always was there. I was not really there in this story. It, it was the constituents which, which this, this was there. Um, Woody Allen, he was asked, you, so you want to be immortal on the silver screen, on the movies. You, know, you want to be immortal, that's why you make movies, you want to be immortal on the si silver screen. And he said, in his typical manner, he said, no, I want to be immortal in my apartment in Manhattan. You know? <laughs> that's what we all want. We want to continue as conscious beings. Not as protons and neutrons, since that has no... Anyway, so this is the story. Consciousness evolved from matter. There's an opposite point of view. Object or matter evolved from consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental and this material universe has come from consciousness somehow. Who says this? All religions. All theistic religions, just a philosophical way of saying God created the universe. You see, no religion which believes in God will say that uh, my God is a non-conscious God, uh, is, is unconscious, is a zombie. No. Every religion believes that the creator God is a conscious God, capable of thought and intelligence and all of that. So, this is the theist. Religion. Theist religion. So whether it is the Christian God who creates the universe uh, or, the, or the Old Testament Abrahamic God uh, of, the, of the Jews or Allah or Vishnu um, in, the, in the Vaishnavite system or Shiva or the Divine Mother uh, in a Durga. But everywhere you will find the universe is attributed to a conscious divinity. So that's another way uh, of um, relating the two consciousness and object. Object emerges. God creates this universe. Third, the two are parallel. Who says this? 
Sankhya, how do you know that? <laughs> Just say that we have, we have seen the YouTube video. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem. Everybody knows everything now. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I don't have new things to say. Whatever I have to say is was discovered 5,000 years ago. So it's now I am in a fix. I asked a professor. He he's a professor of, uh, uh, of uh, he's an expert in Chinese studies. He's an Indian expert in Chinese studies. He's a top expert in Chinese studies in Oxford University. In fact, the Oxford very short introduction to China was written by him, Rana Mitter. So somehow I happened to meet him, and. I was saying that this is the problem. Uh, the YouTube seems to say everything is out there. So we say, oh, Swami, we have heard that. Now I feel I'm pressurized to say something new, but I don't have anything new to say. <laughs> and then he said something very nice. He said, no, when people go to listen to their favorite pop music group or you know, rock band, they want the golden oldies. They, want, they don't want to hear new things from you. They want to hear about Brahman and Atman from you. <laughs> so Sankhya, philosophy or yoga philosophy says consciousness did not come from matter, matter did not come from consciousness the two are fundamental realities they continue together and they call them Purusha and Prakriti consciousness is called Purusha and the whole material universe is called Prakriti they interact and that's how we have this world our lives where do they interact? right now you are the example of the interaction of Purusha and Prakriti of consciousness and matter you are consciousness and you are encased or you are, um, you are in association with a body-mind provided by Prakriti for you. Notice, it's a very beautiful system. Entire play of science can be contained within Prakriti. So whatever science says, absolutely accept it. And consciousness is something separate, but it interacts with that. Now, where is Advaita Vedanta here? Non-dual Vedanta, what we are talking about. No, not here, not here, not here. You might say non-dual Vedanta says uh, object was produced by consciousness. We just read uh, Chinmatra Vistaritam. We just read consciousness alone. But Vistaritam here means projects. Consciousness does not actually create matter. Consciousness does not actually give rise to a separate reality called matter. Like God creating the universe. No. Just as the rope does not actually create a snake, it's an illusion because of our error. Just as the desert, when it, there's a mirage, it doesn't actually create water. It looks like that. So consciousness itself appears as, as this universe. So we can sort of put it this way. The fourth option would be the Advaitic option, where consciousness sort of appears as the object. The object, I put it in a dotted form, Advaita. And consciousness appears as the object. Consciousness real, object is an appearance. There are not two. See, in the, when uh, you are saying God created the universe in dualistic religion, there are actually two things. There is a creator and a created. In Sankhya, there is the separation between, uh, create, uh, between consciousness and object. In materialism, there is definitely a separation. In materialism, actually, there is no separation in the sense that it is the object alone which ultimately appears as consciousness in some complex bodies and minds. In Advaita, it is like materialism, but just the opposite. Just the opposite. Instead of matter finally appearing as consciousness, here it is consciousness which appears as matter. Just the reverse. Swami Vivekananda says, I am a materialist of a sort. He says, tongue in cheek, you know. And what he means is that instead of saying matter is fundamental, I say that consciousness is fundamental. And consciousness alone appears as what we call the material universe. You see, right now one of the major problems is this relationship between um, consciousness and matter. Since this is the prevailing worldview, science has to answer the question how consciousness comes from how consciousness comes from matter. Science has to answer the question. And you'd be surprised to know that it is a huge, huge problem. We should be able to solve this problem. If you're saying the brain produces consciousness, that's the 
that's the prevailing uh, wisdom but how does matter produce perceptions thoughts feelings subjective first person experiences this is the so called hard problem of consciousness so i'm glad i'm teaching advaita vedanta at this time when this is being asked in the proper way by consciousness studies experts all over the world david chamas who is in new york uh, nyu is the head of the mind brain consciousness unit there is a philosopher he has coined this term the hard problem of consciousness basically the question is how can a physical entity like this or this lectern or this pen the brain is also a physical entity nervous system brain it's a physical living physical entity how can it have an internal aspect what does it feel like to be inside you know sight sound taste when you're tasting coffee there's a particular flavor which you experience there's a warmth and there's a, um, a flavor which you experience there's a satisfaction there's a reaction to it all of these are experienced quite apart from the actual chemical things which are going on when the coffee touches your uh, tongue and the neurons are firing in the brain that's the physical component of it but you inside you are not feeling neurons flashing or, or sparking uh, when you drink coffee you don't feel a little burst of electricity no you feel warmth and taste and flavor and alertness none of which are captured by those bursts of electricity they are somehow associated clearly they are associated but how and why you would be surprised to know there is no explanation for this uh, i I've, i've been attending some of the talks so david chama sort of knows me as uh, the guy in orange <laughs> in fact in one of the it's there in the youtube you can't see me david chama is speaking he's conducting a seminar in nyu on the hard problem of consciousness and q and a he's conducting the q and a and he he says okay the guy in orange and then you can hear me speaking <laughs> that was me but they don't show me on the camera <laughs> and even recently so what does david chamas think of sankhya or advaita i'm glad to tell you just last year in nyu uh, there was in the philosophy department there was a, a seminar a colloquium the hard problem of consciousness and advaita vedanta advaita vedanta perspective on the hard problem of consciousness a um, young professor from australia miri albari she is working on vedanta and buddhism and she has written a number of very nice papers um so she is saying that exactly what we are talking about that the solution lies in the advaita vedanta perspective of consciousness so and there is one more person oh in in that seminar i remember it was uh, i went to attend that seminar and there were a few from the vedanta society who tagged along also so we attended it and uh, it's a small group maybe about 20 people but some of the top philosophers in the world if you google right now top 10 philosophers now living if you just say top 10 philosophers it will say plato and aristotle and socrates <laughs> but living now in that list three or four of them were in that room and they are discussing what advaita vedanta has to offer to the hard problem of consciousness so did they buy it no it's a tough crowd <laughs> but i will say this much all the objections to the advaita vedanta perspective they all stand on a misunderstanding of advaita some misunderstanding you can point out that when the question comes why is this like this how can you know this is not acceptable but they are misunderstanding advaita in some way if you clarify that then the objection doesn't stand at all anyway so that's what's going on now what does david chamas himself say about the hard problem of consciousness he recommends he he propounds something called panpsychism he says it's quite possible he says it's a crazy idea it's quite possible he says consciousness is not produced by the brain it's not produced by matter it's a fundamental reality of the universe just like matter energy time and space so consciousness is a fundamental property of the universe he says nothing more than 5000 years ago kapila was saying the same thing <laughs> yoga philosophy patanjali and sankhya philosophy they are saying what he is saying is this there is matter it's real it's not a projection like advaita says it's a real thing out there separate from consciousness but consciousness and matter interact consciousness is fundamental not produced by matter panpsychism 
and uh, it led to tremendous controversy. Many scientists do not agree, most of them, because it's impossible, it doesn't fit in the paradigm. Because you see the scientific paradigm is, they have taken this to be real already. They have assumed this to be real. Matter is assumed without question to be the only reality. So everything else, life must be a product of matter, mind must be a product of matter, consciousness must be a product of matter. And I have had this argument with different uh, philosophers, uh, of scientists. And there is a person who is a well-known biologist and the head of philosophy in uh, CUNY, City University of New York, Massimo. So his, his point was, he doesn't agree with David Chalmers. He said, oh, David Chalmers, panpsychism, he comes up with one idea after another, each worse than the earlier one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, why is it bad? Um, his point was, he's a biologist. So his point was, just a few years ago, maybe 50 or 100 years ago, life was the great mystery. And people thought life cannot be explained by science. But now we understand, life is, um, is explained to, a, to down to the almost the molecular level. Is explained by science. So right now, consciousness seems to be the great mystery. It cannot be explained by uh, brain processes. He says, give us time, 30, 40, 50 years. And we will, we will be able to explain consciousness satisfactorily in terms of the brain and nervous system. Consciousness, he says, is something that goes on in living tissue. How? We don't know. He's, we are honest. We have no idea how it's happening right now. But we will be able to do it. Just like we have explained life, we will be able to explain consciousness. This is called promissory materialism. <laughs> promissory mat yes, it's a term. If you Google it, you'll find it. Promissory materialism is, I will explain it, just give me time. 30, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years? No, no, no. No. It cannot be done. Why not? From a Vedantic perspective, we know enough right now, after doing the first verse, you can say what is wrong with this approach. If you say, life was a mystery, now I explain life in terms of molecules, you know, chemistry, I can explain life in terms of biochemistry. So consciousness is a mystery. I can also explain later on. Sometime it will come when I can explain consciousness in terms of brain activities. Why is this wrong? There's a big fundamental problem there. It's not a thing. Right. It is exactly. Who said the sub subject? It's not a thing. Right. <laughs> Correct. This is a simple thing that they are not seeing. You know what is the problem with that answer? The problem is this. Vedanta will say, when, when you say, put this question to a Vedantin, to Shankara or somebody, immediately they will reply. Or the Chandala. Chandala might do a better job <laughs> of confronting Massimo. <laughs> he will say immediately, prana, life, is an object or not? We, did, did, did we not do that? <sighs> this breathing is just one aspect of prana. Every other physiological aspect, circulation of blood, the production of hormones, enzymes, um, digestion, every other, including um, um, neuronal activity, all of them are activities of prana. Are they objects or not? Yes. The breathing you can see like this, with finer instruments, medical instruments, even the more subtler activities in the body, they also become presented to you, your consciousness. So all of the activities of prana, prana is an object. And what you have done, O oh scientist, is you have explained an object in terms of other objects. You have explained life forces, prana, in terms of other objects called organic processes in the body. But consciousness is not an object. Now you are saying that I will explain consciousness in terms of an object called neuronal activities in the brain. That's an object. No, you are making a category mistake. You are making a jump. David Chalmers humorously says, in an interview, he says that if you spend long enough on the hard problem of consciousness, you will either become a panpsychist or you will go into administration. <laughs> You'll give up and become an administrator. Go into administration. Um, there is another philosopher, Galen Strawson. Galen Strawson. He is even more bold. He is in the University of Texas. His father was, I didn't know that until recently, his father was a very famous philosopher in England, uh, Peter Strawson, so he's called the younger Strawson. Um, Galen Strawson, he takes the bull by the horns. He says, there is no hard problem of consciousness. 
Instead, he says there is a hard problem of matter, which Shankara and Ch the Chandala would appreciate very much. <laughs> he says, what, what is the problem of consciousness? What nonsense? Consciousness is there's a problem only because you have assumed that somehow brain produces consciousness. One. Second, how brain produces consciousness, I don't know. Hence, there is a hard problem. I have assumed here is consciousness. Clearly, it is produced by the brain because that's how, what my paradigm tells me, scientific paradigm. But I third, consciousness, brain, third, I don't know the connection between the two. Hence, hard problem. But you first let go of that assumption that the brain is producing consciousness. Then you see there is no hard problem of consciousness. Rather, consciousness is the most evident thing of all. The most evident thing, the most clear thing. What is most evident to us except consciousness? All that we are doing right now, you are seeing, hearing, um, talking, thinking, in what? In consciousness. All our science is done in consciousness. All our religion is done in consciousness. All our philosophy and medicine and brain science, all of that is done in, in consciousness. So everything is done in consciousness, all our life. It's not just one more problem to be solved. It is the fundamental problem. Do you see the difference? Consciousness is fundamental. Rather, he says, Garen Strassen says, what is matter is a mystery. The more we are discovering, more we are understanding. Uh, quantum mechanics, string theory, the CERN super collider. Matter seems to be disappearing before our eyes. Smaller and smaller and smaller. We are not coming to any fundamental unit of matter at all. So he calls it the hard problem of matter. Slightly tongue in cheek. This is no problem of consciousness. We could not state the next sentence which will come in this verse, uh, Maya. We could not say it any more clearly than this. Uh, consciousness is fundamental and matter appears to consciousness. Yeah. So what is the Advaita approach? The Advaita approach is this. What is that Advaita way of relating consciousness and matter? How do we come to this conclusion that consciousness is fundamental and matter is an appearance in consciousness? Why not the other options? So what Advaita says briefly is this. If two things cannot be experienced separately, then we have no right to call them two independent realities. If two things cannot be experienced separately, we have no right to call them independent separate realities. What does it mean? This pen, it looks like one entity. I'm giving a crude example. It looks like one entity, but actually there are two here. There's a cap and there's a pen, in this way. And I can show you the cap without the pen. I can show you the pen without the cap. So I can say there are two things here. Yes, they appear together. But I can show them, experience them separately. Hence, they can say that they can, they can exist separately. In a very crude way, I'm saying this. But when I say table and wood, yeah. this table, that one, there, wood and table. I'm using two words which have different meanings. Yet, can I show the table, the lectern, apart from the wood? No, I cannot. Can I show the wave apart from the water? No, I cannot. Can I show the necklace, the bracelet, uh, the golden ornament, apart from the gold? Here is gold, here is the golden necklace. No, I cannot do that. Though I am using two words, which means if you cannot show them separately, they must be the same entity. It is the same gold, which has a name, which is a new form, which you call necklace, we give a new name and a function. It is the same wood, which you make into a lectern and the lectern is a particular form and a name and a function, Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara. But the material is the same thing. They are not two separate realities. The ornament is not a second reality apart from the gold. It is gold, there is no second reality, non-dual. Gold, an ornament, gold is non-dual. There is no second reality called necklace. The, le the wood here is non-dual with respect to the, the table. Because there is no second thing called table apart from the wood. The wood is non-dual with respect to the table. In the same way, we say, Brahman and this world, you, the consciousness, 
and the object of consciousness you the consciousness and the object of consciousness you cannot show them separately all the objects that have ever been experienced have been experienced by consciousness by you in, in your consciousness so it's not two things here is the objective universe here is consciousness I can show the objective universe separately it's, it's actually the term consciousness is involved in what I'm saying when you say experience showing it means consciousness is already there so you cannot have object apart from consciousness an object is always is something you can define an object as that which is presented to consciousness yeah. in more philosophical language if two things cannot be, one thing cannot be experienced apart from another thing, then that thing which cannot be experienced apart from the first thing, that thing must be an effect and the first thing must be a cause. Effect and cause. Cause in the sense of material cause. Um, in Sanskrit, upadana karana, material cause. The wood is the material cause of which table is the effect. Water is the material cause, cause of which wave is the effect. Gold is the material cause of which ornament is the effect. Consciousness is therefore the material cause of which the universe of objects is the effect. And the, um, the effect can, is not a second thing apart from the cause. Just as the ornament is not a second thing apart from the gold, the wave is not a second thing apart from um, the water. Uh, another way of understanding this is if you count, if you go to the ocean and count the waves, if you ask how many waves are there, you say it's difficult to calculate, but let's say a thousand waves. Count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven thousand maybe. And if, if you count water, one thousand, will you say one thousand and one things, a thousand waves and plus one more water? No, the moment you count water, you cannot count the waves separately because they are all water. You can't double count. <laughs> then it becomes all is water. If I say count water, then you say, oh, there's only one thing, water. And then the waves, they are non-dual. The water is non-dual. There is no second thing called a wave apart from the water. Let me repeat. There is no second thing called a wave apart from the water. The water is non-dual with respect to the waves. Let there be 10,000 waves. They are all appearances of one water. Let there be a thousand different pieces of jewelry in Tiffany's. But they are all appearances of one <laughs> gold. The gold, the, the, the jewelry is non-dual with respect to the gold. The gold is non-dual with respect to the ornaments. Similarly, consciousness is non-dual with respect to its, to its objects. Because those objects cannot be presented or experienced in the absence of consciousness. You cannot count, if I ask how many entities are there in this, this room, uh -huh. you'll count. There are 75 or 76 human beings and there are so many tables and chairs and lights. You can give a whole list of many, many things and say how many entities are there apart from your consciousness. You can't count. You can't count because it has to be somehow brought into your awareness for you to count it at all. <laughs> apart from consciousness, a, a very powerful example is a dream example. In your dream, there are so many entities, so many people, so many things happening. And... You are yourself there, your own body is there, you can see it. But when you wake up, then all the people, all the animals, all the entities, they are all nothing apart from you, the dreamer's mind. If I say count the entities in a dream, you can do a census and count so many things. But if I say from your perspective as the dreamer, how many things were there? All of it was nothing but my mind. You can't count mind plus a human being, an animal, and a park, and a star. No, they're all projections of my mind. Similarly, what is the relationship between the dreamer's mind and the dream objects is the relationship in the waking world of you, the consciousness, and the objects presented to consciousness. So it's not apart from consciousness. Consciousness real, objects appearance. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya. Brahman is real and the world of objects is an appearance. A appearance of what? Of Brahman. So that's what it means. Brahmhevaham idam jagatya sakalam chinmatra vistaritam. I am Brahman. So this is the second Mahavakya. Remember the great sentence, I am Brahman. The second verse is based on this great sentence, I am Brahman. And then the entire world of objects, it's actually not separate from me. 
I alone appear as all these objects, just as I, the dreamer in my dreams, appear as all the objects in the dreams. So everything here, the body, the mind, and all these people, and all the objects that, come, that, that are in front of me, they are all projections of me, the consciousness, of I, the consciousness. How does this happen, if you ask? The answer is Maya. Sarvam chaitad avidya trigunaya. Asesham uh, maya kalpitam. So the maya is introduced here. I'm not going to dilate on that. This extraordinary, inexplicable power of consciousness, which enables it to project this entire universe. So Brahman, pure consciousness in association with maya. What is maya made of? Trigunaya, three gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas. I'm not going to go into the details. Sankhya philosophy, yoga philosophy talks about it. So this is all borrowed from Sankhya. Maya projects this entire universe. Out of what? What is the material which it projects? You, the consciousness. You are projected. The consciousness is projected as an object. The eternal is projected as the ever-changing. The blissful is projected as a bundle of pleasure and pain. The complete is projected as the incomplete, ever-seeking, never satisfied. So that is the role of Maya. Ashesham Maya Kalpitam, without exception, everything here is projected by I, Brahman, in association with Maya. This, by the way, is the god of religion. Brahman plus Maya is the god of religion. What we saw in the first verse, Sa Evaham, I am she, uh, the witness of the entire universe. That is the god of religion, according to Vedanta. Ittham Chasar Yasya Dridamati. So who has this firm conviction and that, uh, that completely fixed in the ever blissful, ever pure Brahman, and I am that Brahman, who is stabilized in that, not confused. I begin to get it Swami, but the moment the class is over, I'm get, getting confused. That is not Dridamati. Drida means fixed, firm. That is Adrida, unstable. So that is not enlightenment. You still have to work on it. But the one whose conviction is absolutely clear. One of our monks went to a great Advaita teacher in the Himalayas and asked him, so what is enlightenment? Manisha here means conviction. What is this non-dual con conviction about non-duality? And this teacher told him, right now that you are this Swami, you are a man, this is not the product of thinking, understanding, it's an um, unquestioned acceptance. The day you have this much or even more unquestioned conviction that I am the witness consciousness, I am the one consciousness, the underlying reality of this universe, I am Brahman, then you are enlightened. That much clarity, unshakable, beyond question. Like the sun shining there doesn't require any argument. Look up, see, don't, don't look at it directly. <laughs> So one whose understanding is fixed here, Dhiramati Sukhatare Nitti Pare Nirmale, let that person be a Chandala or um, a noble Brahmin, that person is my Guru, this is my conviction. Now the third one, third verse is based on, very loosely, very loosely based on Tattvamasi, that thou art. It talks of the stages of spiritual life. See, what are the stages of spiritual life? Very, very briefly, those are not mentioned here. Yeah, it talks of the stages of spiritual life. Let's put it this way, four stages. I'm writing them down, uh, the original Sanskrit words. These are from Vichar Sagara. Pamara. Vishayi. I'll explain. Sadhaka and Siddha. Siddha is the perfected one. Sadhaka is the spiritual seeker. Vishayi is the um, is the 
Vishayi literally means a worldly person, but it means a, not in a bad sense. It's a decent, the backbone of society, basically a decent person in the world today. Vishayi literally means the seeker of objects. Vishaya means object of consciousness, who wants. I want money and pleasure and success and fame and learning, all of that. A man of the world, but a good person. And the Pamara is a person who leads an instinctive, uncultured, Pamara literally means uncultured, uh, crude, instinctive life. Now, what does this Pamara want? The four goals of human life. Moksha, um, Dharma, Artha, Kama. Kama means pleasure, sensuous pleasure. Artha means all sorts of worldly success, wealth and power and achievement and status. Literally it means wealth, Artha. And Dharma means Morality, ethics, religion. So very briefly, there could be a person who just wants pleasure, um, who wants, say, to become, to become rich and have a party, a blast all his life. Yeah. There could be such a person. There are many such people. Yeah. But uh, that kind of person, it leads to, ultimately, very soon it leads to trou uh, trouble and, and you know, I love that quote from Somerset Mom who says, if you single-mindedly chase pleasure, very soon you find nothing pleasing anymore. Little better than this person is, so this person, it could be, there's a whole range, even, even a person who is, uh, say, addicted to drugs, and not even to wealth, if, if a person has no control over oneself, uh, maybe alcoholic or addicted to drugs, that could be at the bottom of the scale of Pamara. There could be a little more, a person who is addicted to success and power and wealth and does not care for morality just so that the police don't catch me or the IRS don't catch me. That's also part of the spectrum of Pamara. Little better than this, or much better than this, is the Vishayi, who also wants, by the way, pleasure and success in life, but on the basis of morality and ethics. This person thinks of himself or herself as a good person, as most of us do. We are good persons, we are decent persons, we are law-abiding. Not just because the police is going to catch us. It's because we think of ourselves as good and decent persons and to do the right thing. So most of society is made of such people. Otherwise society would collapse. So most people are good and decent persons and they teach their children to be uh, ethical and moral. So ethics and, mor uh, and morality, they kick in at this level. Yes, you ch chase your uh, goals of pleasure and success in the world, but on the basis of ethics and morality. What does this have to do with us? As we go further and further in this way of life, slowly one begins to see all those goals, pleasure, success, um, you know, wealth, all of them are temporary. They come and go, and the satisfaction that they bring, that also comes and goes. There's a limit to it. We may think unquestionably, especially when a person is a teenager or a young person, this, if I get this kind of a job, I'll really, really be happy. If I get that degree, I'll really, really be happy. And I get that relationship, I really, really will be happy. Not, somewhere deep inside we know that's not true, but it drives us to that. And then experience shows us that it is all transient, it is all limited. So he says, Shashvan Nashwarameva Vishwamakhilam The entire universe, whatever it can produce, whatever it can provide, is transient, impermanent, anityam, momentary. Nashwaram means destructible. Shashvan continuously destructible. Not that after some time it will become insipid. Whatever we are achieving and experiencing, moment to moment, it is slipping away from our life, uh, our hands. Even the word Jagat, Jagat means Gachati ti Jagat, that which goes is Jagat. Now Jagat is the word used for the world in Sanskrit. Gachati ti Jagat, that which is continuously slipping out of our hands is the word. Mm -hmm. The words, the word for body in, in Sanskrit, Shariram. Sharira means body. 
But if you etymologically derive it in Sanskrit, shiryati, that which ages, ages, decays, sickens and dies. That's the body. Yeah. So ha happy definition of the body. Shiryati <laughs> shariram. So very quickly we realize that there is no satisfaction to be had in this cycle. Even in an ethical way. Unethical way, suffering comes much faster. The blows, kicks and blows come much faster. Ethical way, it's a sustainable life. You can, it can go on for this lifetime, lifetime after lifetime. Lead an ethical life, a moral life. You'll have a good life, this more or less. And after death, we go to heaven and have a nice time there. But it'll come back again. And so this goes on. We see that is also perishable. Is there something higher? Is there something greater? And Nishchitya Guru Vacha, you go to the spiritual teachers, come to the Vedanta retreat, <laughs> in the spirit in the desert. Every religion, every religion kicks in at that moment with the highest teaching. There is something beyond worldly achievements, even ethics and morality. There is the world of the spirit, of God, of soul, the immortal soul. And Advaita Vedanta says, there is an ultimate reality, which if you realize it, then it will truly, truly satisfy, fulfill you. True satisfaction is possible. Completely over, overcoming suffering is possible, but not in these ways. You have to become a spiritual seeker. So the spiritual seeker now goes to the Guru and by the Guru's teachings starts a course of spiritual practice. And spiritual practice, let me just give you an outline. Or maybe later on, I'll give you the outline because we don't have time. When the Q&A comes, I'll give you an outline of spiritual practice. There is, there is Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga, all of that comes at this level. And after this spiritual practice, you come to the final, the highest practice, which is to dwell on this knowledge of Brahman, which we are getting yeah. through Manisha Panchakam and all the other texts. It says, Nityam Brahma Nirantaram Vimrishata continuously dwelling on, Vimrishata means dwelling on, cogitating on, thinking about the eternal Brahman in contrast with, in contrast with the continuously perishing world. Sashwan Nashwaram Vishwamakhilam, entire universe continuously perishing, transient, going away, moment to moment, Anityam. Compared to that, Nityam Brahman, the eternal Brahman, dwelling on that. How do you dwell on that? That's part of the spiritual practice. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Shravana means you hear these teachings. Manana means you think about it. Get conviction. Um, get your doubts answered. And Nididhyasana means meditate upon it. That's the meaning of the second line. Eternal Brahman continuously meditating upon that. How? Nirvyaja Shantatmana. Here Atma means mind. The spiritual seeker needs a mind which has two qualities. Nirvyaja, nirvyaja means pure. Pure. Simplicity. It literally means not crooked. So the vasanas, the desires, the tendencies which push us out into the world. I want this, I want this, I want this. That is calmed down. That is cleansed inside. That is called Chitta Shuddhi, purity of mind. How that happens, we'll discuss later. And I hope in the quick Q&A it will come up. That is one aspect of the seeker's mind, Nirvyaja. The second aspect is serene, tranquil, concentrated, focused, Shantatma, focused mind. Pure mind, focused mind. This is what defines a spiritual seeker. You see, all the problems we will have and guaranteed to have on the path of knowledge, they do not stem from the path of knowledge. They stem from our lack of preparedness for this path. What is the lack of preparedness? Why are we not prepared for this? The two problems. We do not have that simple mind, the pure mind, one. And we do not have that calm mind. These two are the sources of problem, you'll see. Nothing else. Then what happens? One realizes, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. And realizing that, then one becomes free of the law of karma. Quickly mention this and I'll bring it to an end.
what is the law of karma so he brings in so many things in this third verse I'm doing it an injustice by rushing through it the whole of spiritual life basically he just indicates it in the third verse whole of spiritual life leading up to enlightenment what is the law of karma So dharma, what we know to be good, morality, ethics, we saw that earlier. Follow that, that leads to, I'll give the English, punyam, merit. And that leads to sukham, happiness. Adharma, if one is consciously naughty, deliberately naughty, that leads to papam, sin or demerit. That leads to Dukkham. Sorrow. So Dharma is moral, moral action. And Punyam is merit. And this is um, happiness. Immoral action. And this is demerit or sin and this leads to sorrow this is the law of karma do good the results will be good for you good things will happen things will go your way you will get more artha and karma do bad then the results will be you put forth, forth effort nothing seems to go your way things bad things keep happening to me it's my past bad karma so what is the moral of this? Be careful about karma, what we do in this world. So deliberately, consciously seek the moral, the right, the right thing to do. Continuously, consistently keep doing it. And carefully avoid what we know already, our conscience tells us it's not right. Easy to say this, <laughs> difficult to do it. Um, Swami Vivekananda put it very simply. Good, good, bad, bad. Good, good bad bad and none escape the law but whosoever wears a form form body mind wears the chain too the chain is law of karma all that we have done in past lives has come here and then he says then what good is vedanta if this is none escape the law now what vedanta does is far beyond name and form that is body and mind is Atman ever free? Consciousness, existence, consciousness, place. It's always free from, from karma. Yeah. Know thou art that. That's all that you have to realize. I am that Brahman. That sets you free from the law of karma. So how Shankaracharya puts it here is very beautiful. Once you realize I am that Atman. Bhutam bhavi chadushkritam pradahata sangmin maye pavake. In this knowledge, the fire of knowledge. I am Brahman. In that fire of knowledge, all past accumulated karma and any new karma is burnt up. Is burnt up. All the accumulated karma of past lives is burnt up. But there is a portion of karma which has started giving results in this life, like an arrow in flight. You can't stop it. It has started giving results in the form of this body and what's happening in this life. That will continue until this body falls until this body dies. So he says, Prarabdhaya samarpitam swavapu and this particular body, I give it unto the sway of past karma, the prarabdha karma, the particular part of karma which is activated and giving results now. That will continue until this body dies. This is how the enlightened one lives. Swami Vivekananda puts it very beautifully. Take no, no heed of how it lives or dies. Its task is done. Let karma float it down. Float what down? This body. Let karma float it down. That is Swami Vivekananda's words. Shankara's words are Prarabdhaya samarpitam swavapu. Swavapu means this body, one's body. The enlightened person's body. Prarabdhaya, that portion, portion of karma which has started giving results in this life. Samarpitam, let it float it down. I remain as the witness of the play of, of, uh, of karma in this particular body. So that is the meaning of the third verse. Just this indication, Nishchitya Vacha Guru, having 
determined from the words of the Guru. That's what indicates. What are the words of the Guru? The Guru teaches ultimately many things, but ultimately the Guru's instruction is that thou art, Tattvamasi. So that's why he's saying that Tattvamasi is the <laughs> Mahavakya for this third verse. All right. I am sure you have lots of things for the basket. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Hastu